Today we're going to discuss the ten plagues of Egypt and how they mirror the signs of the times prior to the second coming of Jesus Christ. Many people find it interesting that the Saints Volume 1 begins by talking about the Tambora eruption and how it affected the weather around the world, but caused climate change that drove Joseph Smith's family south to Palmyra. The story of the Ten Plagues may actually have a similar beginning. While we don't know the exact date of the Exodus, it is believed to be about 3,600 years ago, approximately 16th century BC. During the 16th century BC, 500 miles northwest of the Nile Delta in the Greek island of Santorini, there was a volcanic eruption. This volcanic eruption has been hypothesized by experts for many years as the cause of the Ten Plagues and is even the subject of a BBC documentary. Could a volcanic eruption lead to the Ten Plagues of Egypt? Santorini was blown apart by a gigantic volcanic eruption that was thousands of times more powerful than a nuclear weapon. It was one of the biggest explosions of the last 10,000 years. The ash cloud from the Santorini blast would have been huge and far-reaching. Could the effects of this eruption have reached as far as Egypt? When Santorini erupted, the wind was blowing in a southeasterly direction towards Egypt, Samples of Santorini ash have been collected from the seabed, the heaviest concentrations being in the direction of the Nile Delta. Oceanographer Dr. Daniel Stanley went to the Delta and drilled for samples of mud and silt to see if the ash could have reached Egypt. He found volcanic shards that can be firmly related to the explosion. But what would have been the effects, especially if Egypt was experiencing a drought at the time? Let's look at each of the ten plagues one by one. The first plague was the river turns to blood. Exodus 7, 17, and 18 describe the Lord telling Moses that he will turn the river to blood and that the fish will all die. While this sounds extraordinary, and truly it is, it isn't unheard of. Beginning in 1991, a similar phenomenon occurred in North Carolina, in the Pamlico Sound, where the river literally turned to blood and all of the fish died. While it took several years for science to figure out what it was that had happened, it turned out that an organism called Fisteria pisticida, try saying that ten times fast, the second word means fish killer. Research has shown both toxins being released as well as a direct feeding on the fish. Fisteria is benign until the right conditions are met, specifically shallow, poorly flushed, polluted, meaning nutrient-rich water, with a high concentration of fish. The fisteria attacked the fish, causing legions, hemorrhaging, and then death. The estimated number of dead fish exceeded 1 billion across a 66-square-mile area over the next six years. Nutrient-rich as a result of volcanic ash combined with a drought, and perhaps even if it wasn't a drought, could be the perfect conditions for fisteria to turn the Nile River to blood. The second plague was frogs. Exodus chapter 8 verses 3 and 4 says, And the river shall bring forth frogs abundantly, which shall go up and come into thine house, and into thy bedchamber, and upon thy bed, and into the house of thy servants, and upon thy people, and into thine ovens, and into thy kneading doughs. And the frogs shall come up both on thee, and upon thy people, and upon all thy servants. Verses 13 and 14 says, And the Lord did according to the word of Moses, and the frogs died out of the houses, out of the villages, and out of the fields, and they gathered them up upon heaps, and the land stank. A frog partially breathes through its skin. However, this becomes a problem under the conditions mentioned before. The fisteria blood and toxicity of the water would force frogs from the Nile and surrounding areas to leave and begin looking for other water sources. Within a few days, frogs would die and begin to decompose. Lice is mentioned as the third plague. Exodus 8 verse 17 says, Aaron stretched out his hand with his rod and smote the dust of the earth, and it became lice in man and in beast. All of the dust of the land became lice throughout all the land of Egypt. While the King James Version translates it lice, most other biblical translations say gnats. This would make more sense because it is clear from verse 17 that both man and beast were affected, and there are no strains of lice that live both on humans as well as animals. Additionally, decomposing frogs, and even more so, fish, would result in gnats or small flying insects. The fourth plague is flies. Exodus 8 verses 21 and 24 says, 
I will send swarms of flies upon thee, and upon thy servants, and upon thy people, and into thy houses, and the houses of the Egyptians shall be full of swarms of flies, and also on the ground whereon they are. And the Lord did so, and there came a grievous swarm of flies into the house of Pharaoh, and into his servants' houses, and into all the land of Egypt. The land was corrupted by reason of the swarm of flies." Rotting fish and frogs would naturally cause swarms of flies within a couple of days. There are many species of biting flies that can carry a variety of diseases. Notice it said, the land was corrupted. By reason of the swarm of flies, sanitation was no longer possible. No clean water, one major food source, being fish, was gone, and everything was being infected by diseased flies. This is where a major promise is made that most people overlook. The Lord promised to spare those living in Goshen, where the Israelites lived. As you can see here, Goshen is significantly south of where the plagues took place, where the Israelites were living. They were not affected by the plagues. There were no flies, no frogs, or dead fish nearby. This becomes an important detail as we continue this narrative. The fifth plague is the death of the Egyptian livestock. Exodus 9 verses 3 through 6 reads, Behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thy cattle, which is in the field, upon the horses, upon the asses, upon the camels, upon the oxen, and upon the sheep. There shall be a very grievous murrain, and the Lord shall sever between the cattle of Israel and the cattle of Egypt, and there shall nothing die of all that is the children's of Israel. And the Lord appointed a set time, saying, Tomorrow the Lord shall do this thing in the land. And the Lord did that thing on the morrow, and all the cattle of Egypt died, but the cattle of the children of Israel died not one. The diseased flies now have bitten and infected the livestock of the Egyptians, while the Israelite animals are left healthy. The livestock die off. Water contaminated, although it might be cleaned up by this time. No fish, no livestock. This only leaves grains as the remaining food source for the Egyptians. Next comes boils. Exodus 9 verses 10 and 11 says, And they took ash of the furnace and stood before Pharaoh, and Moses sprinkled it up towards heaven, and it became a boil, breaking forth with blains upon man and upon beasts. And the magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils, for the boil was upon the magicians and upon all the Egyptians. The infection from the flies impacted the animals first, but then also caused boils to come upon the Egyptians. Boils are caused by germs that enter the body through small nicks or cuts. This could have been the bites of the flies or resulting from scratching the skin when the flies were swarming. Again, Pharaoh hardens his heart, and the Lord makes a promise. And in Exodus 9, verse 15, it says, For now I will stretch out my hand, that I may smite thee and thy people with pestilence, and thou shalt be cut off from the earth. Pestilence is defined as a fatal epidemic disease. Bubonic plague is one of the three types of plagues caused by bacterium Yersinia pestis. One to seven days after exposure to the bacterium, flu-like symptoms develop. These symptoms include fever, headaches, and vomiting. Swollen and painful lymph nodes occur in the areas closest to where the bacteria enter the skin. Occasionally, the swollen lymph nodes may break open. The three types of plagues are the result of the route of infection, bubonic plague, septicemic plague, and pneumonic plague. Bubonic plague is mainly spread by infected fleas from small animals. It may also result from exposure to the body fluids from a dead, plague-infected animal. In the bubonic form of plague, the bacteria enters through the skin through a flea bite and travel via the lymphatic vessels to a lymph node causing it to swell. The seventh plague is fire and hail. Exodus chapter 9 verses 22 through 25 says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch forth thine hand towards heaven that there may be hail in all the land of Egypt, upon man, and upon beast, and upon every herb of the field throughout the land of Egypt. And Moses stretched forth his rod toward heaven, and the Lord sent thunder and hail, and the fire ran along the ground, and the Lord rained hail upon the land of Egypt. So there was hail, and fire mingled with the hail very grievous, such as there was none like it in all the land of Egypt, since it became a nation. And the hail smote throughout all the land of Egypt, all that was in the field, both man and beast, and the hail smote every herb of the field, and break every tree of the field. Then in verses 31 and 32 it says, And the flax and the barley was smitten, 
and the barley was in the ear, and the flax was bald. But the wheat and the rye were not smitten, for they were not grown up. This is where some believe God's use of natural law breaks down. However, if we go back to the cause of the very first plague being caused by the erupting volcano, hail, fire, lightning, and thunder do occur at the same time. This would have burned the fields, destroyed any grains and plants that they were growing. It even destroyed the trees with any fruit. Now there are no fish, animals, grains, fruit, or vegetables. The grains that were just harvested or about to be harvested were lost, but the wheat and the rye had not yet grown enough to be destroyed. Whether or not this is the result of a second eruption of the volcano, which is more likely in my opinion, or the effects of the first eruption, we don't know. Next is the plague of locusts. Exodus 10 verses 12 through 15 says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out thine hand over the land of Egypt for the locusts that they may come up upon the land of Egypt, and eat every herb of the land, even all that that hail hath left. And Moses stretched forth his rod over the land of Egypt, and the Lord brought an east wind upon the land all that day, and all that night. And when it was morning, the east wind brought the locusts, and the locusts went up over the, all the land of Egypt, and rested in all the coasts of Egypt. Very grievous were they. Before them there were never such locusts as they, neither after them shall be such. For they covered the face of the whole earth, so that the land was darkened, and they did eat every herb of the land, and all the fruit of the trees which the hail had left. And there remained not any green thing in the trees or in the herbs of the field through all the land of Egypt. The fires and storms that brought the hail could be the same force that drives the locusts out of the desert into Egypt. This would be especially true if it were during a drought. The locusts devour any and all remaining food in the land. It was likely a similar phenomenon that happened to the early saints in Utah, where a desert fire or the like drove the crickets towards the saints and their crops. Unfortunately for the Egyptians, they didn't have seagulls nearby. Next is the plague of darkness. Exodus 10 verses 21 through 23 reads, And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out thine hand towards heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, even darkness which may be felt. And Moses stretched forth his hand towards heaven, and there was a thick darkness in all the land of Egypt three days. They saw not one another, neither rose any from his place for three days, but all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. This is probably more evidence of a second eruption as well, but to put the magnitude of the Santori eruption into perspective, in recorded history this is one of the largest four volcanic eruptions in the history of the world. It was larger than 40 atomic bombs and approximately 100 times more powerful than Pompeii. It was so large and blew out so much material that it created a gigantic crater that remains today. This would have caused darkness in many parts of the world for several days as the debris blotted out the sun and ash fell from the sky. Then the final plague, the death of the Egyptian firstborn. Exodus 11, 5 and 6 says, And all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die, from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sitteth upon his throne, even until the firstborn of the maidservant that is behind the mill, and all the firstborn of beasts. And there shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as there was none like it, nor shall it be like it any more. Then in Exodus 12, verses 29 and 30, it says, And it came to pass that at midnight the Lord smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sat on his throne, until the firstborn of the captive that was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of cattle. And Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all of his servants and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. There have been many people who believe in the consecutive nature of many of the plagues. There have been many that link the first nine plagues with the Santorini volcanic eruption, as I have described. But it has been difficult for those to tie the final plague of the killing of the firstborn to the same sequence. I offer here some possible explanations, as I believe this too may be able to be tied to natural events of the plagues, but perhaps not. The pestilence described just after the sixth plague could be the beginning of the bubonic or another similar plague. But why only the firstborn? Could it be a genetic marker that the plague attacked? Perhaps, but it could have been something social as well. For example, remember the food source had been wiped out. The Egyptians could have been starving. 
Did the Egyptians turn to the rotten, spoiled meat to stay alive? Were the Egyptian firstborns those that would test the food for the rest of the family? Or due to the threat of Moses, did the firstborn males come together for protection and eat something that killed them? Were the firstborn those that handled the diseased animals, infecting them with the plague? Or did the firstborn, in addition to most of the rest of the Egyptians, die? It doesn't say that it was exclusively the firstborn, but that the firstborn were killed. Perhaps the deaths were more widespread. There are simply not enough details in the scripture to know for sure, but there are enough plausible ways that this could have happened that I feel it could have been part of the natural sequence put in place by God with the original volcanic eruption. Then again, God, using methods that we don't understand, may have just killed the firstborn. In Doctrine and Covenants 89, which I know being the section on the word of wisdom is a strange place to turn right now, but look at the final promise in that last verse, verse 21. It says, And I, the Lord, give unto them a promise that the destroying angel shall pass by them as the children of Israel and not slay them. This verse refers to the destroying angel and is clearly referencing the final plague of Egypt before the Israelites were set free from bondage. This also lets us know that in the latter days, there will be another destroying angel released upon the wicked, which we can avoid if we are true and faithful. It is interesting that the term destroying angel is only used in scriptures once and only in Doctrine and Covenants 89. And while DNC 89 does make it clear the destroying angel is what brought to pass the final plague in Egypt, even in Exodus, it is described as a plague that killed all of the Egyptian firstborn. So, Doctrine and Covenants 89 foreshadows the coming destruction in the last days by pointing to the ten plagues of Egypt. Now, turning our attention to how the ten plagues of Egypt foreshadow signs of the times just prior to Christ's second coming, we need to understand chiasm. Chiasm is a type of Hebrew poetry or imagery in writing. It is where phrases or concepts are stated in an order and then repeated in reverse for emphasis. A simple example in English would be, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. But often in the Bible, there are longer and more complex chiastic verses, like this one found in Joel 3. There are many examples of this throughout the Bible, and I find it interesting that there have been many found in the Book of Mormon as well, something that could only be present had the original writers come from Israel. But what does that have to do with the plagues in the second coming? The reason I bring this up is because as I was studying the signs of the times, I noticed that the plagues foretold to occur just prior to the second coming seemed eerily familiar to those in Egypt just prior to the Exodus. Doctrine and Covenants 84 talks about the plagues. Doctrine and Covenants 43 talks about thunderings, lightnings, tempests, hailstorms, earthquakes, famines, pestilence, and the like. So just as it was during the Israelite captivity where God sent two witnesses, Moses and Aaron, to release the plagues on the Egyptians so the Lord would save Israel, so will he send two witnesses in the last days to release similar plagues on the wicked just prior to the second coming, where the Lord will save Israel again. It isn't surprising that these amazing events from the Bible are types and shadows of things to come. And when we understand this, we can use the events of the past to better look for the events in the future. So I decided to compare the plagues of Egypt to the plagues that will come upon us in the last days. Each plague that Moses brought down upon the Egyptians mirror a similar plague that the two witnesses will bring down in the last days. This may be the Lord using chiastic structure to illustrate the signs of the times. One interesting difference is the final plague. With the Egyptians, it killed the firstborn. In the last days, there is never any mention that the final angel of death will only kill the firstborn. It seems clear that the final plague will destroy the wicked. In fact, we could say that the ones that are protected are those of the church of the firstborn. And then, just as the ten plagues perhaps began with a tremendous eruption and an earthquake from the Santorini volcano, a great and last earthquake will occur as foretold in many verses of Scripture. How can we gain God's protection from these plagues in the last days? Well, Doctrine and Covenants 97 says that if we are to escape them, we must observe to do all things whatsoever the Lord commands us. And if we don't, we will have plagues come down upon us. But look again at Doctrine and Covenants 89 verse 21, that final verse. This is the final promise in the word of wisdom, that the destroying angel shall pass by them as the children of Israel and not slay them. I take that to mean that by being true and faithful to the commandments, we will be protected from these coming plagues, and more specifically, the final one that destroys the wicked entirely and ushers in Christ's millennial reign. 
Remember what we know to be true. The faithful and righteous have nothing to fear. Thanks for watching.